we've got um, three great um, charities from the UK, uh, from the UK and Ireland, um, who are going to talk a bit about um, what well, what their organisations are currently doing, and then we're going to have a broader panel discussion about where we what we think the situation of children is now and um, what policy makers might do going forward. So um, let me just kick off then by um, welcoming, well, welcoming the speakers. And I think, sorry, I'm looking at my screen. Can I, hopefully we have all three here, but um, shall we start with um, Aoife? Or Aoife, are you there? <laughs> Aoife, Aoife from the... Um, you're from the Ombudsman for the Children's Office in Ireland, I believe, and, and we're just going to pass over to you. I think you may have some slides, um, which I think, yeah. Kat, which Kat or maybe you are going to sh going to share, hopefully you'll be able to do that. And we're giving, going to give each of the um, three three um, panellists a few minutes, five minutes each, to, to just quickly tell us a little bit about what their organisation has been doing um, over the course of the pandemic, and then we're going to broaden out to a wider discussion. Okay, thanks very much, Aoife. Um, if you're ready to share. Thanks. Kat, uh, do you want to share them or do you want me to? It's best if you do. Yeah, it's no only problem. for some reason you can't, then I'll load up your slides. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, I'm already worrying about whether or not I can. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, you'd think we'd have all got used to this by now, but seemingly I am not. Mm, I think I'm sharing all of you. Yeah. Impressive. Is this showing you a presentation? Yeah. Yes. Ah, <laughs> <ta -da. laughs> yep, it's all good. Uh, so thank you so much for having me and I've loved listening to you all day. Um, as Susan said, my name is Aoife McNamara and I am the Participation and Rights Education Coordinator in the Ombudsman for Children's Office in Ireland. Um, so I'll give you a quick little overview of who we are. Essentially, we're a human rights institution. Um, we are... Um, uh, non-departmental uh, government body uh, and we work to protect the rights of children and young people living in Ireland. So we do that in a couple of ways. First of all, we investigate complaints about public services provided um, to children um, and then we also um, have a separate, two separate functions where we teach children about their rights under the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. And we also uh, consult um, and hold participative projects with children to get their opinions and advice. Um, and then we also give advice to government um, on how to uphold uh, children's rights and hold policymakers to account. Um, so 2020, obviously, strange, strange year. Um, for us, I think um, there's a couple of really important issues that, to note that came up um, with our uh, complaints function. Um, internationally, uh, ombudsmen um, for children, their offices tend to get about 3% of their complaints from children. And in 2020, um, our complaints from directly from children went up to 6%. And um, so I think that that was um, a quite a stark thing for us. Um, we encourage children to um, make complaints to us, but frequently it's quite difficult. Um, and they um, might feel that parents or uh, professionals are, are better placed to help them come forward and um, so for us they 100% of the children that contacted us um, in that time talked about um, the, their difficulties with education and um, the impact that COVID-19 was having on their on their health. Um, for us, really, the big kind of issues in Ireland, as um, other people have discussed, was that there was a real lack of clarity around state examinations, which is something that children found really, really difficult to cope with. Um, and then we also saw um, a massive issue around digital divide. Um, it was huge issues of digital poverty. Um, a lot of people in Ireland live in rural areas and, um, you know, don't have... Um, good Wi-Fi access, but then we also find the children in really vulnerable households who may live in congregate living settings, such as um, homeless accommodation or in direct provision, which is where asylum seekers live in Ireland, really struggled um, with their schooling um, because of digital poverty. Um, so here's some just little things of, of children had said to us over the years and really speaks to the difficulties and, and the worries that children were expressing when they came to talk to us. Um, and so I can I can read some of those, but I think they're they're fairly stark. Um, really, that worry that they would pass them on to parents. They were they were vectors. Um, a lot in the media that was really what they were being portrayed as, and that they would pass 
uh, COVID-19 on and um, they were just incredibly anxious all the time um, when they were contacting our, our offices. Um, so obviously we've discussed this a lot, but uh, a lot of children had their education essentially curtailed um, during 2020 um, and this impacted all children of all different ages. And essentially like what we've been noticing is that 80% of the children are, are going to be okay. Like this was a pause in their education. They are going to, they're going to be able to, to get back in, into their stride and they're, they're going to be able to um, make up for lost time. But really what we worry about is the children who, who, are, who have those vulnerabilities. Um, so really uh, the lack of clarity around state examinations, the lack of clarity about um, say the open, whether or not playgrounds were going to be open, um, we find that um, there was a real disproportionate effect on um, children with uh, SEN, which is, has already been touched on as well today. Um, and then we really find that um, our complaints about waiting lists really massively increased during the pandemic. Um, obviously, CAMS um, became quite overwhelmed um, and the, the number of places for children and the, um, the number of of uh, support services open to children really decreased. Um, so that that was kind of um, a really big worry for us frequently, like our, our most frequently complained about things would be education and then secondary health. Um, and that really, the health number really increased in 2020 as well. Um, but we did do some some nice work alongside some children who who um, wanted to, to create guides for each other and things like that. So we saw children really showing this massive sense of camaraderie and, and wanting to help each other out as well, which is something that was lovely. Um, one of the things that uh, we work on um, is the uh, situation for asylum seeking children in Ireland. Uh, that system is called direct provision. And uh, in late 2019 and early 2020, we were undertaking consultation with children living in direct provision about their social inclusion in Ireland. Um, and then the pandemic hit and we thought we we're going to go back and we're going to speak to these children because they will have a really different experience um, from probably children who do not live in congregate settings. So we went back and we did a um, we spoke to some of the children who had participated in the previous direct division uh, consultation. Um, and I think one of the starkest things for us in that uh, consultation was that children who lived on the margins of society, be that direct provision, be that um, in homelessness accommodation or any form of congregate living, felt um, isolated already. And so what the, what the pandemic really did for them was compound um, these feelings of isolation, of stigma around being kind of vectors or something to be avoided and um, they really really felt the digital divide and digital poverty issue and um, really acutely and um, any of their support services that were in place previously stopped during that time um, and that there was just a huge amount of fear of pe with people between people who were living in congregate settings particularly children so I really wanted to share this this quote with you because I think it really speaks to the fact that vulnerable children were already having an extremely difficult time and um, that this child really felt like the lockdown sort of give us all a taste of what she'd have been experiencing for quite some time. Um, so I'll stop sharing there, hopefully, maybe. Um, I just wanted to give you a little flavour of, of what we do and, and what we're about and I can take any questions, but I know other people might want to introduce their own work as well. Thanks very much, Aoife. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll just go around the other panellists and then I think perhaps we can take questions about your organisation and the work you're doing um, after that. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go second. We're going to uh, go to uh, Louise Moore, who's um, working with the Children's Society. Um, Louise, I can't see you on my screen, of course, <laughs> um, but hopefully you're there and you're able to... Um, share your slides yeah i'll try and do that now thank you Susan. that's great hopefully you can see them yeah i think brilliant my computer's a little slow so i do um, this is loading i think so hopefully we'll be there okay 
it's trying and it's definitely trying. <laughs> <laughs> A bit slow. We've got a black screen at the yeah, moment. Really <laughs> maybe this is a maybe this is a normal. But um, I guess we'll give it another minute. Um, but I think Kat also has this, this slides um, as a backup. Yeah, Louise, could you uh, check your settings? Because it says that you have started sharing. Could you maybe stop sharing and start sharing again? Can we give it a go? Yeah, my end is saying I'm just I'm sharing box, and your end is not, which is not helpful. No, nothing. I think I'm going to share instead. That's great. It's, it's yeah. actually breaking up this end, so I suspect it could be my signal. Okay, so. Are we seeing the children's society slides? Yes. <laughs> Great. Okay. So, Louise, can you uh, click through them yourself? Or if not, just tell me and I'll be doing it. Just say, like, next yeah, slide no, and I'll do it. That's great. Thank you, Kat. And I do apologize. I live out in the village and it's um, been a real challenge actually working at home. So um, I appreciate everything everybody's been through in the last year. So yeah, as Susan said, um, I work in the policy and research team at the Children's Society and we're really grateful actually to be here um, today. Um, it's been a really helpful event and, and very important indeed. I think that's someone else's slide on the screen now rather than mine. Oh, wait a second. That's it. It's back onto mine. That's great. Thank you. So um. If you could move to the next slide, Kat, I'll just tell you a little bit um, for those who aren't familiar with the Children's Society about what we do. This one? Or the one before? The next one, please. It should say about the Children's Society at the top, sorry. Oh, okay, it's, it's the first one. Okay. So it's this one, it says about the Children's Society. No. That's the one. That's the great one. That's brilliant. Thank you. So for those of you who aren't familiar with our work, the Children's Society do a combination of direct practice work with children and their families, policy research, campaign and public affairs. Um, and it kind of works as a bit of a circle, really. I guess our direct practice work feeds into our policy and research and campaigning and in turn, policy and research also feeds into our direct practice work. Um, so we have we tend to focus very much on the most vulnerable children um, in society um, and key areas that are focused on by the Children's Society include things like child sexual exploitation, poverty and children's subjective well-being. Now you'll see there on the slide that um, subjective well-being is highlighted and there's two reasons for that. The team that I work in specifically deal with mental health and children's subjective well-being but also this year we've actually moved the main aim in our strategy for the Children's Society to focus on children's subjective well-being for the first time. So we've been really privileged at the Children's Society. We started our program of work on research on children's well-being back in 2005 um, and have kind of continued right up until the present day. Some of you might be familiar with our annual report, which is called the Good Childhood Report, which is an annual research publication that looks at the subjective well-being of children um, in the UK. Um, and from a policy perspective, I guess recent efforts that might be of interest are that we delivered a petition to government calling for more comprehensive measurement of children's subjective well-being. We also have been working with them to try and encourage them to look at children's subjective well-being in terms of children's return to school from the pandemic. And we've also been working with other charities in the UK to try to secure a national commitment to fund early health mental health hubs for children. Um, so that's an insight into some of the work we're doing. Um, if you go to the next slide, Kat, I can tell you a bit about the work we've been doing on COVID-19 specifically. So we've actually been working with other charities to um, look at our practice base and speak to practitioners about the different issues that they've been um, seeing within our services. Um, from my team's perspective, we've actually published two publications which have been concerned with children and parents' experiences of COVID-19. And that's been based on responses to our annual household survey, which is a cross-sectional survey of children aged 10 to 17 and one of their parents. Um, 
the two publications are listed there on the screen. So the first one, Life on Hold, um, was actually undertaken um, during the first lockdown in April to June, which is when we always run our service. So we were just, you could say we fell lucky or we didn't fall lucky. I'm not quite sure which one you'd go with, but it meant that um, we were due to undertake our survey at that time. Um, and we published the results um, from that work back in July last year. And then this year we've actually repeated a number of questions from our 2021 survey in our annual survey. And that again took place in April to June, but we were in totally different circumstances this year. So children had just gone back to school and the national lockdown had started to end. Um, and the most recent results are in this year's Good Childhood Report in Chapter 3. So if we could have the next slide, that'd be great. Thank you. I'll try and give you a really quick snapshot and I'll be quick because I know we've had some IT problems for which I um, really do apologise. But in terms of things that are really relevant to um, this, today's discussion, I guess one of the things that we found this year when we were asking parents about the different impacts um, that they experienced was that of nine impacts we asked about, at least two in five parents said that their family income had been reduced. Um, and whilst lower than parents had said to us they expected back in 2020, we found that three-fifths of parents actually reported that the pandemic had had a negative impact on their child's education. Um, so, as I say, better than, than back in, in the year before, when I think it was around 73% expected there to be a negative impact, but you can still see that there are pockets of children um, that you know, seem to have been well affected by the pandemic. Encouragingly, we saw reductions in the number of children this, in this year's survey who had low wellbeing. So last year we found that um, a bit normally very stable um, measure that we use a multi-item measure of children's wellbeing had gone up to show that 18% of children aged 10 to 17 had low wellbeing. And this year's survey we found that was back to more normal levels at around 12%. So seeing the bounce back that some of the other um, people in today's discussions have also reported. I guess what we don't know is whether that's a temporary bounce back in terms of children going back into education and seeing life more normal. And, you know, it's difficult to know, I guess, for all of us, what the long term consequences of what's just happened to the world will have. Um, fortunately, we found that when asked about how well they coped with the changes that were made from the pandemic, most children felt that they coped relatively well overall with the changes that have been made. Um, and as you'll see there from the slide on the screen, there was a pocket of about 8% of the children that were took part in our online survey who didn't feel they coped very well. Um, and whilst a small subgroup, we are really concerned about that group and to ensure, as others have said today, that they get the support that they need. In terms of specific areas of their life, we found, probably not surprisingly, that the areas that more children said they hadn't coped as well with were not seeing their family and not being able to do hobbies and not being able to see their friends. And given what we know about the correlates with um, children's well-being in terms of needing to have relationships and needing to connect, some of those things there, you know, it makes sense to see that they're the things that they struggled with more during the pandemic. So I'm going to jump, if it's okay, to my very last slide. Well, last but one slide, sorry. Go on. Is this the right one? It should say figure three at the top. No, figure two at the top, sorry. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. So children's feelings about the future are really closely linked to their current sense of well-being. And we were really keen this year to kind of have a look at how children were feeling about the future. Sorry, it's the next slide. Um, because we know that that's going to be important in terms of ensuring their recovery. It's like that bit. That's great. Thank you. So we asked children how much they agreed or disagreed on a five point scale with the statement, I feel positive about my future. And in spite of the challenges of the last 18 months, I'm pleased to say that seven in 10 of those children strongly agreed or agreed with that statement. Obviously, there's nearly sort of 30 percent that didn't. And so there's still a great ground to be made up. But I think given all we've been through, that's quite a positive finding. We also asked children about how they felt in terms of specific aspects of their life and about society as a whole. And that's repeating some questions that we asked them back in 2019. We found that in terms of their own lives, the areas that children were more likely to be very or quite worried about were having enough money in the future, being able to find a job and getting good grades. 
And when we looked at um, broader societal issues, what was really interesting was what came top. We asked them about eight different issues, and the one that came top was future illnesses and pandemics, which I guess shows how much what we've been through has changed people's perspectives. Because I guess if we'd asked about it back in 2019, it probably would have been quite low. Um, the next thing on children's list, not surprisingly, was the environment. So I think that based on our research, we kind of, you know, we're very um, optimistic that children seem to be um, optimistic about the future and that the vast majority of children seem to have coped to some extent. But I think as other people have said today, there's definitely subgroups who haven't. And I think we need to be careful both in, in responding from a policy perspective to ensure that by focusing on the masses, we don't miss those few who haven't coped so well and haven't fared so well. And there's definitely um, things about how children, the concerns that children have about society in their own lives that I think policymakers and practitioners need to be aware of. Thank you and apologies for all the technical issues. Right, thank you. Thank you so much. And yes, I'm, I'm sorry that um, we're having technical issues. Hopefully you can hear us though. Okay, um, we're going to um, just go to our, our last panellist, who's Karen Kiernan, um, who is from One Family Ireland. Um, hopefully, um, Karen, sorry. you're there. Yeah. It's actually Neve Kelly from One Family. Oh, sorry. You're quite right. <laughs> I've the wrong name. I've got two names. I'm done. Sorry, Neve. Neve, um, welcome. And um, yeah, I think you may also have some slides. Um, I do, yeah, thanks we'll very have much. Go, have a go at sharing and um, hopefully that will I'll work. give it a go. Hi everyone, um, I'll fly through these slides and um, so we can get to the discussion. Uh, I know everyone's probably keen to, to kick off. So just a bit about ourselves. Um, we're at Ireland's national organization for people parenting alone, sharing parenting, separating, and who are divorced. Um, we have a big birthday coming up next year. We uh, were established 50 years ago by a group of single mothers. We provide specialist family support services. So that includes um, parenting services. Um, we have an advice line for parents. We have programs for parents and we have counseling services. We also have a number of specialist services for children. Um, the other side of our work then is to campaign to improve the lives of one parent families. Uh, and this is my work um, and really it's divided into two areas. So child poverty and family law. Just going to run through um, a lot of these have been touched on already um, today, so I won't dwell too much, but just on some of the issues that arose during the pandemic for our service users and one parent families in general. Um, one parent family started off the pandemic from a very low base in, in Ireland, they have higher rates of poverty, deprivation, indebtedness, mortgage arrears, um, and during this time, this impacted one parent families a lot, the loss of income, the loss of employment. So we carried out a survey at the start of the pandemic, looking at how one parent families were faring during the pandemic and loss of income came out as one of the top areas that, of concern, about 25% of parents worried about their loss of income. So another area that impacted all families, but hit one parent families particularly hard, is the lack of childcare. One parent families in Ireland are um, more likely to be reliant on uh, paid childcare. They also um, rely heavily on family for support and that, that was um, not available to them during this time. Uh, one parent families are uh, overrepresented or highly represented in, in essential workers. So in care work, retail, low paid part time jobs, so they were more in need of childcare during the pandemic and the issues relating that you know have been discussed here already relating to um, working from home and or parenting from work, as it has been referred to. Um, and uh, homeschooling were particularly difficult for one parent families because there wasn't you know for people parenting alone, there wasn't another parent there in the house to um, share the load. Another area, again, where one parent families um, fared worse before the pandemic, 
um, and this was compounded during the pandemic, was around isolation, loneliness and anxiety. So again, in our survey, this came across where parents were saying they felt very isolated. There was also more recently a survey published by the Central Statistics Office in Ireland, um, which indicated that two out of five people parenting alone um, experienced uh, isolation and loneliness or were sad and lonely, I beg your pardon, um, all or um, most of the time. Worryingly, that research also found that um, a quarter of all parents in one parent families didn't have anyone to turn to if they had an important or an urgent issue to deal with. So that's quite, quite worrying and it speaks to the isolation that was experienced and compounded during um, the pandemic, but is likely to, to um, persist into the future. A big issue for one parent families during this time was access and child maintenance. So um, access arrangements, which perhaps were um, uh, facilitated with other parties during uh, normal times during the pandemic, parents were trying to work that out amongst themselves. And it was difficult for some parents to, to gain access to their families or to their children rather. Uh, child maintenance, uh, there again is another issue which was raised by parents with us at the start of the pandemic. So both informal and formal arrangements for child maintenance fell to the wayside in some cases and parents weren't getting the, the, receiving the child maintenance for their children. There's, it's important to note that in Ireland there is no um, for child maintenance system and all arrangements are really done on a private basis. The last area that was a big concern um, during the pandemic restrictions um, was domestic violence. And this is an area that impacted one parent families also. So the withholding of maintenance is financial abuse. You had instances of coercive control and a big issue for some parents was having to um, liaise with their abuser in terms of access arrangements because the 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 conduit or maybe somebody who would have done that in in normal times was not was not available so just to fly through some of the work that we did during the pandemic um all our services adapted to be able to um continue during the pandemic and during restrictions so our services moved online we um our counseling services moved on uh, onto the phone and they continue to do so we were constantly um, raising issues relating to social welfare, relating to family law, child protection and other issues on an ad hoc basis and on an ongoing basis, um, responding to issues that arose. Two core areas, um, I suppose, that came up in terms of problem solving or examples of the types of problems we were solving during the, that time. Um, at the start of the pandemic, children were really treated as pariahs and they weren't allowed um, into businesses and particularly they weren't uh, provided access to shops. So this is something that we raised uh, with government and they responded and um, children were permitted access because this is a massive issue for one parent families who had nowhere to leave their, their children when they went uh, shopping, just grocery shopping. This issue again ar arose more recently in relation to vaccination centres and I think these two areas are highlight a common problem where one parent families aren't really thought of in terms of policy making or or um or programs and um, there's they can often be an afterthought so for vaccination centers we worked with the hsc the health service executive here in ireland um to develop a protocol whereby families could actually access um vaccination centers with, with children and um, we were hearing stories of you know parents foregoing their vaccinations or you know, in some cases, leaving children in cars, which is obviously not not ideal um, or, or um, OK. So a big change for us during this time and coming through some of that work, like the access to shops, is we set up and chair a national one parent family alliance. So it's bringing together groups who are working on one parent family issues into an alliance. We're currently working on a pre-budget submission, but it's really we're finding it as a, a great tool in terms of amplifying the voice of one parent families. Um, we have some large national organizations sitting on that group, such as the St. Vincent de Paul, Bernardo's um, and Focus Ireland who, who, who deal with um, housing. So it's really giving um, a bigger voice to the issues that we're representing day to day. So going forward, um, we will be continuing to respond to the needs of one parent families. 
we can't tell exactly what's going to happen next. I think if any of us have learned one thing in the last 18 months, it's that we don't know what's coming up. Um, but one thing we do know is that there is a massive backlog of need and there's a massive um, uh, backlog of, uh, uh, particularly of need for services and for children to, to get support from services. And that's something that we can continue to work on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, no, it's really interesting to find out what um, organisations have been doing during the course of the pandemic. Um, what I want to do now, we have we have about 50 minutes left um, this afternoon. So what I wanted to do was just turn to some questions, which I'll sort of put first to the panel members and uh, to think about uh, the situation of COVID the situation of children as we sort of emerge from the pandemic and what perhaps we uh, needs to be done. Um, and then I want to also open the floor for a sort of broader discussion. So if I just sort of, um, if we go around the panel first and then we'll widen out. But just to sort of think a little bit about what we've heard um, today, obviously, um, you know, we've seen lots of empirical research and, and qualitative research presented. And I think some, you know, I think many of the messages are that from, from most families with children, the pandemic has obviously been a very tough time. Um, not for everyone, of course, it's, there are some exceptions, but I think also what's, what's coming out of the data so far suggests that perhaps some of the things we expected to find were perhaps not yet finding in the data, of course, it may still happen. And here I think, we're think I'm thinking particularly about some of the inequalities we, everybody has been predicting that we'd see that are perhaps less than less than we, we might have predict, predicted in the, the data that we have so far. Of course, that might change and it might just reflect some of the measures that we are currently picking up. Um, I also thought it might be worth hearing from our panel um, as we sort of think about the pandemic, whether they think there's any really gaps in the evidence. What is it that they would like to know that we haven't maybe touched on today? And something that sort of struck me is that we've talked an awful lot about schools and school closures, but we haven't really talked much about preschool children and the situation of those families. So I don't know if you have sort of particular thoughts on what their needs might be or what research evidence might, might help inform policy or practice for those um, particular families. Okay, um, so just moving on to think a little bit about then the questions we wanted to think about. What I wanted to start off was uh, with was the question about whether how pan the panel members think about the current, think um, the situation of children and uh, is currently. So as we come out of the pandemic, where do they see the ch children being now? What do we, they think the circumstances are? Um, and I suppose related to that is what whether how they think that might change, how they think these the the COVID will have affected children uh, in one year time, in one year's time, in five years' time. What is their sort of prediction for children as we as we emerge from hopefully emerge from the pandemic in the next few years? <laughs> um, shall I start with you, Neve, as you're you're currently on my screen? <laughs> Sure. Um, I suppose uh, I think it's important to remember that for children, the pandemic um, hasn't necessarily gone away, maybe as much as it has for adults because they, they aren't vaccinated. Um, and I think things like the um, loss of education, obviously, is is the big thing for children in the last 18 months. But that persists because um, certainly in Ireland anyway, I don't know what the, the process is in the UK or in schools, but if there's any symptoms at all or if there are close contact or indeed if they if they are diagnosed with COVID, then they have a loss of school then as well. Um, so those issues are to some extent still persisting. Um, and I suppose as well, that, that piece I spoke about just in my introduction around the backlog of need, um, you know, we saw a huge rise in domestic violence cases and issues relating to domestic violence um, during the pandemic. But I mean, that was really, I suppose, something that was there to begin with and that children were locked away in a house with, with their abuser or in a situation of domestic violence. And, and those, um, whilst well, the immediate, in, in many cases, unfortunately not all, but in many cases that the immediate risk might have gone, the psychological and um, emotional damage of that risk has, has not. And, um, you know, 
delayed um, health interactions as well. I mean, we have a massive waiting list for certain um, uh, health um, interventions for children in Ireland, such as things like mental health and speech and language therapy and things like that. Um, and those delays are still there. Children are still on waiting lists. So it's, I, I don't want to be too doom and gloom about it. You know, children are, have an undoubtedly many children have developed resilience within this time but for those children who are dealing with things like poverty um, and we know that most of those children live in one parent families um, they are dealing with a backlog of of um, issues relating to that and we've saw I think if you use austerity and the austerity years were particularly severe in Ireland I think out of all EU countries um, we've we've learned the lesson here, or at least I hope we've learned the lesson that the people who are faring worse at the outset of a crisis go on to fare worse as a result of it. So that 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 is where I think I see policy change needs to step in and 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 governments need to act in terms of mitigating against those um those areas. Um in terms of one to five years, sorry, I'll be brief brief. Um I think it really depends on that level of support from government and from, from um, society more generally to step in and, and bridge, bridge that gap. I think if you look at um, Adam's presentation earlier in terms of the catch up on education um, just during that pandemic period and that that inequality disappeared, it disappeared because there were supports in place. And that's a, a model that we can adapt more generally nationally um, to really step in for the kids who need, who need it most. Mm, very interesting. Thank you very much. Okay, and um, can I go across to you to next, Aoife? Um... Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd really echo what uh, Neve is saying. Like today, currently there are 14,000 children um, isolating at home and out of education in Ireland. Um, so very much as Neve has, has touched upon, this hasn't necessarily ended for children in the way in which it might have ended for adults where people are returning to offices and things like that. There are still disruptions in children's lives. Um, one of the things that we are um, we noticed was that in uh, 2020, the referrals of uh, child protection issues to us went down. So they would usually come through our complaints mechanism, but also through um, our interactions with children. Um, and I think that one of the things that we might find um, is that there, there's been many missed opportunities to protect children within their homes. Um, in 2021, now in, in the last you know, nine months, our child protection um, referrals and incidences that we have identified have, have already gone up. So um, it would be interesting to see how that will play out in, in the coming years and months. Um, and again, it's kind of this, uh, it, I'm not sure what's happened there to Aoife. Um, let's see, hopefully she might bounce back in a second. Otherwise, um, if we can go to you, Louise, we'll just give her a, give her a minute. <laughs> I'll see if her, I think her internet may have hung up. Yeah, my internet. Oh, yeah, so you're back. <laughs> there. Sorry about that. Just to the Sorry, stress of presenting. <laughs> stories of working from home you know and yeah. um, but yeah like as Neve was saying like we have really long waiting lists already for CAM services and um, our assessment of need processes is very slow we have huge waiting lists for that as well so those Okay, I think we've lost Aoife again, sorry. Um, Louise, can I go to you and then hopefully Aoife's um, connection will be stabilised um, in a minute. Yeah. Yeah, of course, of course, Thanks, Louise. <laughs> no, no problem at all. Um, I think really I'd reiterate what um, my colleagues have just said, really. I mean, I think we have to look at the wider context and I don't think we were in a particularly good place before the pandemic in terms of the legacy of the decade of austerity. And I think in many ways, COVID kind of added to that as an additional disruptor. Um, there were obviously, you know, a number of challenges around child poverty, increasing numbers of children going into care and increasing mental health support needs prior to the pandemic. And I think 
we're in a situation where there's obviously been a bounce back in a lot of the research which is really encouraging but I think it's you know kind of there were existing things that needed to be um, addressed and now on top of that there's Covid to consider. Um, I think the other thing that I would say is there's very much a focus at the moment particularly in England on um, sort of building back in terms of education which obviously ignores those who aren't in education um, and you know kind of particular subgroups that we've talked about today who might not even want to get the support they need in school so I think we need to think a bit more outside the box and think about you know kind of other settings as well and that's one of the reasons that we're you know trying to encourage um, support for hubs for young children um, to be able to access services in other settings as well as you know kind of within the school setting. I think in terms of how children will be doing in a year and five years from now. I think it's it's you know it's probably going to be some time before we can fully appraise the impact of the pandemic on children, particularly in terms of their mental health and well-being. Data from before the pandemic showed that children's well-being was already in decline. Um, so I think the kind of studies that we've heard about today, the longitudinal studies, are going to be really important in allowing us to be able to look at the same set of children and really be able to separate the influences of things like Brexit and everything else that was already happening um, from the impact um, of the pandemic itself. Um, I think, you know, there's certainly some suggestion that there's been an initial bounce back but that could just be children being relieved to be back in school not in lockdown um, and as I say I think you know kind of in the longer term we've got to be really careful many children probably will recover but there's going to be pockets who've experienced a really bad time you know it, it could be due to existing inequalities but also just in terms of the the level of impacts that they've had from Covid you know losing relatives and so on and so forth um, but I think we really need to take into account variations in children's experiences that I'm not sure current policy allows us to do that yeah absolutely um sorry Aoife I think I see you're back <laughs> so I'll let you come back in again um, and hopefully you'll stay with us <laughs> sorry um you've probably forgotten where you are but so, oh, <laughs> <we're> still... <laughs> so we were we were still on the sort of question of you know how you think the situation of children is today and how, what do you see you know happening in the future um the next one to five years yeah um i suppose that one of the really crucial things that has been touched on quite a lot today as well is is funding um in uh 2020 we had a really uncertain election in ireland um and there was um uh, kind of holding government in place and then when there was cabinet discussions happening um, there was talk of um, the Department for Children and Youth to, um, to be taken away that that department would be disbanded um, and I think that that was a real concern for our office and um, what this has taught us this pandemic is that children um, are at the sharp end of, of poverty and of deprivation and that we need to ensure that there is a dedicated government mechanism in place and that we'll fund properly the NGOs and service providers but also will you know ensure that there's proper public services in place as well and um, so I think that that's one thing that um, anybody working in the children's sector in Ireland would agree that something we don't need to be fighting about again is that that that, that dedicated department would stay there and thankfully it has and um, but we would like to see as well that you know, if we do go into a recession and that there's that there's cuts to services, that children's services would be the last to be cut, um, and that the cuts would be proportionate, and that those the fundings would be restored as soon as possible because children have suffered the most throughout this uh, pandemic. Thanks. Right. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure. I think what I'll do is I'll. I'm going to, I want to ask you about how what you think policymakers should do. So I wanted to, I, I think maybe I'll roll the next two questions together again, just partly in the interest of time and partly so it'll allow um, other participants to maybe come in at the end and we can sort of get, get some final thoughts on where we think we are with the pandemic and what, what we need to do both as researchers, but also as people who influence policy, hopefully. Um, so what I wanted to, to, to come to next was um, the question of, uh, policy. What do you think policymakers need to be doing? You know, and I think I've already touched on some of these, and we know that there are many, many multiple problems, sort of in terms of the backlog that has built up with COVID and the problems that have also been compounded and created as a result of school closures and and the, the general sort of COVID crisis. Um, but 
Maybe I could find, I mean, one thing I wanted to, I think is sort of obviously very notable in the case of the UK is if we think about how children have done over COVID and what maybe has protected um, children from lower income families um, from doing much worse is possibly the changes in the welfare system where universal credit had a short uplift and of 20 pounds a week and in and, and of course we had furlough which meant that some people were able to stay at home with their children and be paid a replacement um, for their wages so I think maybe those are being protective factors um, but of course these are both coming to an end so I wondered you know of course we don't really know we can't predict what the fallout economically will be but it would be it would be really good to sort of have your thoughts on you know what you think the consequences are likely to be um, but also I don't know the situation in Ireland so it would be good to know what what happened in Ireland did you have a similar furlough to the UK or um, and and how has the welfare system responded and how is it planning to change? Um, so I don't know, Aoife, shall I go to you as your um, signal is still holding up and hopefully it will carry on doing so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, Susan, we did have a, a similar uh, furlough scheme um, in place, um, and I think that that did help a great many families. Um, one of the interesting things that kind of happened during the pandemic was that um, a lot of families were um, housed, and we saw like a reduction in uh, childhood homelessness, um, which was which was quite an interesting development. Um, now, whether or not that happened because, you know, um, people couldn't. Put their rental properties on airbnb or whatever it is um but it was an interesting thing i think for for us in the ombudsman for children we really want to see an end to um this extreme poverty that has been perpetuated in ireland um especially with children living in congregate living settings um so whilst the, the the pandemic provided us a slight buffer for, for for maybe some homeless families as well to get them housed and we wouldn't want to see a return to normal um in that in any way shape or form and um, i think that um we need to be ensuring that um that particularly homeless children have you know somewhere to stay one of the you know it's it's, it's the most basic way a child can thrive in their environment if they put somewhere safe and warm to be um one of the things as well um, that we, um, I've just literally lost my train of thought there, <laughs> I apologise, um, but uh, yeah, I suppose if we don't want to receive a, a return to normal in any way, um, we want the, um, the childhood poverty to be tackled. Um, one of the, um, the buffers that the UK, well, England in particular, put in place was um, this idea of free school meals and that that um, was a really important thing that was not taken up in Ireland. Um, we have a, a very small scheme at the moment um, which is providing free school meals for I think only about a thousand schools so we have a long way to go in that way um, to kind of even up and ensure the children are not suffering from food poverty in Ireland as well. So I think that's one of the real lessons that we could learn as well from, from the UK which is probably touching upon another question but thank you. Thank you. No, it's very interesting. Um, Louise, can I just go to you back to sort of the policy questions and Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, I think um one of the key issues, I think, particularly in England, is that we don't make policy specifically for children we look at it always through a different lens so we either look through from an education lens or a housing lens but there's no consideration of the whole child and I think that's kind of something that's really difficult and I think you know kind of even before the pandemic but even more so now I think we need a strategy or a minister who is responsible um, for children and sees them as a whole and I also think um, something that I'd really encourage is and it's been spoke about by some of the presenters today is sort of more of a child-centered approach in terms of listening to what children think they need on the back of the pandemic as well because I think that voice is often missing there's so much focus on what us adults think um, and actually children tell us about you know kind of we know that some children actually feel they felt they were better off during the pandemic when they were at home because they've been bullied in school and so on and so forth and I think you know kind of we miss those those kind of issues I think from our perspective just following on um, from you know kind of what, what's just been said really is that actually the uplift in universal credit and the provision of free school meals were real positives and you know I don't think we can underestimate the consequences of taking those away um, so I think you know we've got some 
some quite challenging times ahead potentially and then the other thing and is that you know kind of the pandemic has so much I guess shown a light on the family and the importance of the family for children um you know kind of at times they've been totally reliant on that and I think you know kind of this kind of supports that have come on the back of research that we've heard about today for parents is amazing but more needs to be done to look at that and to kind of you know help families that have struggled through the pandemic um so I think I think there's quite a lot that could be done um yeah it's uh you know kind of as i said earlier i think you know the pandemic in some ways has added to um some difficulties that we're already experiencing indeed thank you and yes i guess we've had some temporary reliefs with some of these new you know recent measures but um <laughs> they're not going to be lasting very much longer sadly in the uk okay neem um thanks um yeah, I suppose we do have a uh, dedicated minister for children and we do have a de dedicated strategy as well, but it has come to an end last year. Um, our, our CEO chairs the advisory council for the, it's called the Better Outcomes, Brighter Futures. It's the national children's strategy. And our chair, our CEO chairs the, the group, um, the advisory council um, set up to advise government on that. So I, I know that they have developed a, a child poverty paper and they've they've submitted that to the minister so what we're hoping is going to happen is in the next iteration of the national children's strategy there will be a specific pillar dedicated to child po poverty so essentially a child poverty strategy so that would be really positive from our perspective because like louise said all the poverty strategies are you know poverty generally um, but child poverty is is a huge issue and children in Ireland have a much higher rate of poverty than adults so we feel they need a, a dedicated strategy um, I guess during the pandemic here one thing that happened was that um, we have a, a pretty much solely private um, system of, of child care so um, child care is center-based it's usually individual operators there's a few chains but it's, it's a lot of them are just operated by on a solo basis and then you have a huge um, uh, informal child care that goes on as well so you know grandparents and that kind of thing um, but there isn't there isn't a, a system set up during the pandemic the government stepped in to pay for um, the wages of child care providers or the, the child care professionals um, and that's something that has been pushed for for a long time is to have a, a nationally funded child care um, now they have come back and said that that won't be that won't be sticking around but I think with these these slight wins and no more with you know we have our pandan our pandemic unemployment payment is the equivalent to to um the payment in the UK um you know, it's 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 similar to basic income, universal basic income, and these are things that for for a long time have been said are not possible. But we've seen where there's a will, there is a way, and obviously you need the money to fund these things. But decisions can be made um, to fund what's important, and and children are, you know, one of the most important things in our society. And I think that the the it's up to our sector and both researchers and and people working in policy. Um, to push for these things and not to let them go because policy takes so long to, to get changes. Um, one, um, one other point I just wanted to echo um, that Louise made was around, you know, research, the research that goes into, um, into policy making. We've seen so much of it here, um, you know, Jeffrey's research and Jim's research this morning, um, that that's that participative research that is using not just parent voices, but really it's it's crucial to have children's voices and children's meaningful participation in the policies that affect them. Um, and this is something that, you know, it needs to be done from the outset and not as a as an as an add-on at the end of something where their, their views are sought. Um, and it, it, I think policymakers often view it as a challenge, but having worked um, on participative projects with children in the past I mean there's such added value to getting their views from the outset they really do make you think of things differently um, and they are very they are very clued into what's effect, affecting them and they know what's um, what their challenges have been during the pandemic so we really need to listen to children as well yes very interesting Okay. If I can just jump in there, yeah, see if please you please mind. Please and so I'm just seeing some comments. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, we um, in the Armstrong for Children's Office um, are a part of um, a global uh, study called CoVision. 
um, and this is encouraging at the moment um, the involvement of uh, children in the co-design project of what this this is going to look around the effects of, of children in COVID. Um, so um, we don't have anything to share because we are right at the, at the, at the start of this because it is um, to be a co-design project, but um, completely echo what everyone's saying. We, um, participation and consultation is at the core of what we do in the Ombudsman for Children and Children's Voices are, are the most important people to be listening to at this time. Um, I will just say we are at the moment um, preparing um, a children's report to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. And whilst this is about like a much bigger, you know, human rights issues and it's kind of reflecting on perhaps where we've come in the last six years since the last um, submission, we did do a survey um, of children and we got 5,515 responses from children. Um, between the ages of we've right down to like two which was helped out by their parents and right up to 17 and we have some really rich qualitative data which really speaks to what happened to children during the COVID-19 pandemic and following on from that then we have done focus groups alongside about 20 uh, NGOs um, and spoken so far to um, 108 children um, and that is reflecting not just COVID, but their opinions on inequality and inclusion, their opinions on their education and things like that. So whilst we don't have any anything we can produce today to, for you, we are very much in, in the process of doing some really large scale um, participative work, um, which will which will reflect um, rights as a whole, but also the, um, the COVID-19 impact. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. No, that's great. Um, All right, Susan, can I just make one yes, more point please, on that? Just on, on, on children's participation, <laughs> just in terms of policymaking and um, for policymakers, I think our sector is really important in getting not only children's voices, but those um, maybe not mainstream children's voices. And I think a lot of times um, consultation or participation is done with children and they're from a particular background or they're you know they have parents who are able to facilitate them engaging um, and I think it's really key for for organizations like EFAS and and Louise and myself to um, make sure that those sort of hard hard to reach is a, not, not a term I'm a fan of but you know children who are from disadvantaged backgrounds who maybe don't have the access to these um, uh, to, to policy and policy makers um, I know ch children in general don't have a huge access but um, it's crucial to make sure that those children's voices are heard as well as Absolutely. children more generally Absolutely. and I know Aoife, Aoife the, the office of social or, or office of ombudsman for children has done um, great work on that in the past yeah yeah so that's kind of um, when I was presenting um, our work really with looking at what was happening with children in direct provision during lockdown that was just a consultative process um, and that is you know just presenting their views and often we find that that's a really important thing to do just let the words be there and we don't overanalyze and um, what the children have said they're experts in their own advice and their own lives um, and we find it really important to speak to um, children who are seldom heard and what we're, we're saying in the office now is children who find us hard to reach we have to work hard to find them but they're yeah so um I think it's it's a really interesting thing and that's that's really what we can be doing throughout this is is the children who are going to slip through the cracks otherwise we need to be working extra hard now to engage thanks Steve and I just say as well that um, it was one of the things that we found really helpful when we did our life on hold report that I talked about was we spoke to children in our services who often are the children in the kind of hard to reach groups. I hate that term, but um, it, it really helped us to see some of the challenges and actually that some of the children in those groups, particularly children who are experiencing mental health problems before the pandemic, actually found being at home some of the time easier because they hadn't got to think about the stresses of going to school on top of everything. And that's kind of, I think, one of the really good things that we found from that was we saw a bit of some of the benefits that children experience because I think you know kind of the, there have been a few not many but I think some people have had a few but it you know kind of it really brings to light some of the survey data which is you know are much more kind of children in mainstream education and you know kind of um, not in those harder to reach areas. Okay. No that's great thanks it's really interesting to get those sort of perspectives from the sort of different contexts as well where we've had you know similar challenges but also I think quite different policy responses 